I'm Michael Eager. I'm the local secretary for San Francisco Regional Medicine. Let me introduce our speaker. Karen McCullough is a writer, teacher, and a book reviewer. She's been a member of San Diego Mensa since 2004 and has written the Page Turners book review column in the Mensa Bulletin since 2015. She's published four books, including American Trivia and American Trivia Quiz, with, co-written with Richard Lederer. Her most recent books are two novels, Quest for the Ivory Caribou and 26 Eskimo Words which I presume all means snow. And uh, <laughs> I would like to welcome Carolyn McCullough. I won't make you guess at that. The, the 26 Eskimo words uh, is for snow, but uh, in the book it's explained that that's really a phony. And somebody wrote an article once about the uh, Eskimos having seven different words for snow, and then somebody uh, quoted them but said 12 and somebody else quoted that person and said 19 and it got up to around 30 I think uh, so that that really is not really true that they have all those words for snow their language is not that complex in terms of that particular word uh, hello everybody I'm glad to be here today uh, I, as uh, was mentioned I write the book review column for the Mensa bulletin it's called page turners and uh, if you have written anything, I hope you're going to send it in for review. Uh, I'm not always nicey-nicey. You'll want to look and see what I write uh, before you send it in to see if you can stand to have me uh, critique your book. But I always want to say to people, uh, I'm just one opinion. Everybody gets an opinion. And whatever you're writing, there's an audience for you someplace if you want it. So. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I assume there's some people here who are writers and some people who have not started writing yet. My theory is that all people are writers at heart and uh, they just don't know it. So I'm here today to convince you that maybe you really want to start to write something. Uh, I have a website and I hope you'll check on it. I have some, uh, so far five out of 13 planned short essays on that website on how to get started as a writer. and I, they're not on the website yet. I was hoping to get them up before today and it didn't happen. So if you're interested, you can get in touch with me and I will send you copies of those essays as I complete them. Uh, as I said, there are five done right now and you're welcome to, to read them and critique them if you want to. I'm always interested, uh, you know, if you want to write in and to me or anywhere and critique the column that I write. I'm glad for that. I'm always glad to have people helping me improve my writing. So uh, anyway, my website is my name, Caroline McCullough, author.com. Uh, and uh, my email is my, my name, 989 at gmail.com. And I'll let you know those at the end of the talk also. And if you have to, you can always find me through the Mensa website. Uh, you can write to the bulletin and they will forward stuff to me. Uh, as was mentioned, I am Richard Letterer's writing partner. I do a lot of editing for him and he edits for me and we write, we wrote two books together. Let me tell you, he's as much fun in person as he is in his column. I hope you all get a chance to meet him someday in person because he's just a great guy, great to work with. Uh, my two novels published so far, I'll give you a little commercial here, are part of a series of five written so far and I'm planning a sixth about a young, not a young widow, an older widow, she's 60 from San Diego, who is mired in depression at the loss of her husband and is convinced to go off to Ottawa uh, to do some genealogical research because uh, her, her husband's family had some connection with Ottawa. She goes there and finds out that she's related by marriage to a whole village of Inuit in Northern Canada, up in Northern Quebec. And she decides she has to go there to find out what that's about. And the stories all move off of that basic uh, idea. And I've had a lot of fun writing them. I think writing is a lot of fun. And I think you'll have fun reading them if they're your cup of tea. Uh, anyway, uh, my other commercial is I hope you'll all come down for the San Diego Urge, the regional gathering, which take place on May 27 through 30. And I'll be doing a talk there, not this same one probably. Uh, and we'll also have an author meet and greet that you're welcome to come to. And Richard Letterer will be doing a couple of talks. So 
and, along with a lot of other very interesting stuff. So you can come down and learn to hula. We're going to have somebody teaching hula. So come and join us. Okay, the basic question at hand, I would say always is, why write? And writing is a lot of fun. That's, that's basically the reason to do it. And if you haven't written anything in, since high school or college, and it was a big pain at that time because you had to write a 400 word essay on all the king's men or Huckleberry Finn or something like that. Uh, when you're writing for yourself, it's much, much better, let me tell you. Uh, you get to create worlds if you're writing fiction. And even if you're writing uh, nonfiction, you get to create worlds the way you want them to be. And I look at, the, at life today and we've got COVID and we've got stuff going on in Ukraine and our government is just a little nutsy. And the kids, are your kids never do what you want them to do? And the economy's weird. When you write, all that goes away. It's just great. <laughs> so I would recommend to you to think about writing. Uh, the obvious way to get started with writing, the easy way to get started with writing, is to write memoir. And the reason I say that is you have a plot and you have characters already created. You don't have to do that part of the work. So you can use memoir to build your skills as a writer and then move on to anything else that you might want to do, whether you want to do nonfiction or poetry or uh, murder mysteries or you name it, anything that appeals to you, uh, you can certainly do that. Uh, memoir is a lot of fun to write, or I would say a lot of fun for most people. There are some people who write memoir for cathartic reasons. They've had a terrible childhood or they've had a terrible illness or they've had a terrible marriage and they want to just get that down on paper. And that's certainly doable and uh, you can do that without necessarily showing it to anybody else. Writing does not imply that you have to publish. And I will tell you that as soon as you tell someone that you're writing, they will say, oh, when are you going to publish your stuff? Or when can I see it? The answer is, mm, maybe never. Or I'm sorry, I'm just not ready to show it to people yet. Because writing is your process. It's your chance to run the world the way you want to run it. And you're not required. Part of that uh, process is you're not required to share it with other people unless you want to. But you will probably want to as you get into it. You'll find that it's more and more satisfying to share your ideas with other people. And it's a lot of fun. It just is a lot and a lot of fun. Uh, writing, I think of writing as the one area where you can be absolutely selfish. People can read what you wrote and they can say, gee, this would be a lot better if you just changed this. And you say to them, gee, thanks, I'll think about that. And there you go, there you go. And you do think about it for maybe two seconds or maybe not, it's up to you because it's your writing. You get to make that world the way you want it to be. Now, I will say every time somebody makes a suggestion to you on how to improve your writing, I would definitely take a note because even the worst critiques can lead to something. I used to be in what's called a read and critique group. And we had a man who was in that group who was just impossible. Drive me crazy, drove everybody crazy. And he would start at the lower left-hand corner of your page and write across it in giant letters, who cares? And I would go home and I would read that and I would just be so angry I couldn't see straight. <laughs> and after I'd cooled down a little bit, I would look at it and I would say, you know, I don't like the way he put that in there, but he's actually right. This is kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> and how would go that page? So even the worst critiques or the worst or the critiques that are presented badly uh, can be valuable uh, prompts, if you want to think of it that way, of, of different ways to think about your writing. Now, the other thing is, I say writing is fun. 
it may not be quite as fun at the beginning because there's a learning curve. And no matter where you are in your in writing, unless you're really well practiced, uh, you need to build your skills up. And that really does come from practice. And uh, as you get more facile at what you're doing, uh, it gets easier, it gets to be more fun. But at the beginning, you'll have a lot of self doubts and you'll have a lot of uh, looking at stuff and saying, oh, this is just terrible, I can't do this. Yes, you can, yes, you can. But you can't improve something until it's down on paper. So don't think that you're gonna do all your writing in your head, then you're just gonna sit down type it out on your keyboard and it's going to be perfection. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> you're gonna look at it, you're gonna set it aside, you're gonna pick it up again and you're gonna say, who wrote this stuff? I cannot believe it. Okay, so then you set to work editing, rewriting and editing. Most people will tell you that writing is really rewriting and that's true. And if you knew how many versions, think of your favorite book, uh, the writer probably rewrote it at least twice uh, before it even went to the agent, assuming we're talking about commercial publishing here. When it went to the agent, the agent read it over and said, I think you need to make A, B, and C changes. And so then they did all that. And then it went to theoretically to the publisher. And the publisher says, yeah, I'd like to publish this. And he gives it to his content editor. And the content editor says, ah, oh, you've got to rearrange these chapters and you need to cut this and cut that and add this and add that. And then it goes to the line editor who said, well, oh, you're not doing your commas right. And, <laughs> and it just, it's an endless process of uh, adjusting and refining. I think of it like being a sculptor and you're making something out of wood and you have this rough grit sandpaper and you sand it down and then you take a finer grit sandpaper and sand a little more and then a finer grit and a finer grit until you get it so there's, it's just smooth as glass and lovely. And that's the process that you're going through with your writing. Um, now, if you want to write memoir, why, why memoir besides the fact that it's easy, an easy place to start? Um, I would say there are a number of reasons for, for writing memoirs. I said before, some people do it for catharsis. They've had unfortunate times in their lives and they need to get it out of their system. Or maybe they need to just tell the world about it uh, so that the world can learn from their experiences or, uh, or, or there are dozens of reasons for why somebody would want to sit down and write down that kind of thing. Maybe you've had unfortunate stuff in your life that you don't want to talk about. Well, here's the thing. It's your writing. You don't have to. You don't have to tell all you know. Now, if you're writing memoir, it's a good idea not to lie. But it's also not necessary to put in everything. I happened to grow up in a family where there was a lot of depression. and My mother was hospitalized with depression for this was back in the 1950s and treatment for depression was not very good. And she was hospitalized and had uh, some just awful times for over a period of years. I don't want to write about that stuff for my grandkids. It just was not a happy time. Uh, all kinds of bad things happened. So I'm, I just decided I was going to write memoir and I was just going to write about all the happy things that I could think of. And it was amazing to me that this sort of uh, not miserable childhood, but difficult childhood that I remembered suddenly began to open up and I began to see all of the good things that I had forgotten. And it really was a, an interesting process for me and a joyful process to just focus on what was my favorite Christmas, what was my favorite game, what was my best friend, what was you know, what was my favorite thing to do in school? It just opens up a whole area of positivity, or at least it did for me, that was really good. Um, so you don't have to tell all you know, you get to tell what you want to tell. You don't have a, um, um, unless you're testifying in court, <laughs> you do not have a moral obligation to tell the world every thought you have, everything you've done. So don't feel that that onus is on you if you decide to write a memoir. Uh, the main idea, I think, to write a memoir is for history. 
And a lot of people will say, uh, and I've had people say this to me, oh, I've never done anything interesting in my life. So why would I write a memoir? Who's going to be interested in what I have to say? Well, let me tell you, think back about your great grandmother. And if somebody came to you and said, you know what? I have just found your great grandmother's diary. How would you like to buy that? Would you say to that person, mm, well, is it well written? I'm only going to buy it if it's well written. No, you would never, ever, ever say that. You'd say, how much do you want? <laughs> you, know, you would want to see that. You would be eager to see that. Okay, your great grandmother probably lived about a hundred years ago, a little more, a little less. Uh, and a hundred years from now, when your great grandchildren are alive, their lives will be as different from what we're doing now as your life is from your great grandmother's. So just going to the grocery store will be interesting for them. I'm going to read a couple of pages here from my late husband's uh, memoir that he wrote. And uh, I hope it will be interesting to you, but I just want to give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Now, my husband was, late husband was born in 1922. And so this is, uh, he spent all of his summers with his grandparents until uh, the Depression. And during the Depression, his stepfather, his father died when he was just less than a year old. His stepfather in the Depression lost a job got a second job, lost that job, and they lost the house. So they went to live with the grandparents and lived there for the rest of my uh, husband's childhood. So this is when he's young, probably, I'm guessing this memory comes from when he's maybe eight years old. Um, I spent most of my days with grandma. She was short, maybe five feet, two inches tall, round, warm, and soft to cuddle with. Most of the time she wore her long gray hair rolled in a bun at the back of her head. She had blue eyes that didn't miss a thing I did in spite of the fact that she wore glasses. Grandma always wore a hat when she went out of the house. She and mom were big on hats. We shopped for perishable food items every day, two or three days. Shopping with grandma meant a leisurely walk of about a quarter mile to the main street. Past the Northport Hotel, we turned left and walked eastward on the north side of Main Street on our trek, we passed four or five doorways before we came to the entry to the second floor Oddfellows Lodge where grandpa spent so many pleasurable hours. Passing several more shops, we entered Zamfino's vegetable market. Besides selling produce, we sometimes bought things not available from grandpa's garden. Mr. Zanfino had big chocolate covered graham crackers that cost a penny each. I willingly accepted a free one. Okay, that's just a, a little taste of what he wrote. Uh, and if you want me to send you, it's four pages total. If you want me to send the, you the four pages, I'll be glad to do that. But you get an idea of the pace of their lives, the fact that grandma didn't drive, uh, the, you get an idea of the prices of things just with that penny for the, for the chocolate covered graham crackers. There, it just gives you a view of a different world that we don't experience anymore, of a time that's gone. And what you write now, even if it seems just mundane as all get out, will be as interesting to your great grandchildren as that is to people who live nowadays. Uh, so I would encourage you to think from that aspect that you are writing contemporary history when you write your memoirs. And even if you don't have grandchildren and great grandchildren, there are people who will be interested in your view of what's going on in our lives right now. And you can write about any aspect of it. You can write about your artistic attempts. You can write about your friends. You can write about grocery shopping or how you spend your days. You can write about your views of politics, uh, of world affairs, of anything. You know, it's, again, it's your writing. You get to do what you want. So I would encourage you to think about that. Uh, aspect of it. Now, if later on you want to publish, that's a whole different thing. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but right now let's uh, talk just about the writing aspect of it. Uh, 
uh, as I said before, uh, it doesn't have to be happy memoir either. If you're writing for your, your grandchildren or your great grandchildren. Oh, by the way, when you write stuff and you, you want to show it to your children, and I'm not the only one this has happened to, uh, your children will say, oh, mom, I'm really busy. I'll read it to you when I'll read it when I get a chance. But your grandchildren are going to say, oh, wow, that's cool. And your great grandchildren are just going to be delighted. They will bless your name for sharing your lives, your life with them. So uh, keep that in mind because your kids, you know, your kids are not impressed with you. They just aren't. So don't expect them to be impressed with your writing unless you write a bestseller and they're going to make a million dollars off of it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, to get started, uh, it's a little bit like painting a room and that is you have to do some prep work. Uh, you have to, simple things. You're going to write with pencil and paper or pen and paper. You're going to type. A lot of people still type on typewriters. Or best-selling authors type on typewriters. It, it, there are many, many of them who do that. Uh, or are you going to do work on a computer? I like working on a computer. There are a lot of things about computers that I loathe, uh, particularly our loss of privacy. But I like writing on a computer because it makes editing so simple. But I know a lot of people I've taught for years taught uh, creative writing for senior citizens. And a lot of them are very hesitant about a using a computer and they are scared to death to do anything. A lot of them don't know how to paragraph, for instance. They just never learned how to do that on their, on their software or they don't know how to cut and paste. And uh, you, that's part of your decision making. If your computer scares you, okay, well, that's the way it goes. You write with a typewriter or pencil and paper, but uh, uh, you can also, as part of your preparation, learn how to use your computer in ways that you haven't before. And the simple thing to do is to write anything, a paragraph, quick brown fox jumped over the lazy old dog, and then just go try out all the functions on your computer and see what works and what doesn't and what does things for you that are useful and what doesn't. And then when you're done, you just get rid of it. Don't, don't save it. So you can do that at any point to try out all those little things that are across the top of the, of the screen that you've never tried before or never clicked on. Give them a try. They're easy. Okay. Uh, talking again about the uh, preparation. So you decide what you're going to use. You ne then need to decide where you're going to work. And a lot of people work uh, in offices. I happen to have an office that's dedicated because I run a little publishing company and uh, so I, I get to write it off on my taxes and things like that. Uh, a lot of people work on their kitchen tables. That's very common. Some people uh, work in coffee shops where you can plug into a, a thing and just sit and type. You go to a Starbucks, you always see somebody writing. I don't know what they're writing, but they're writing. Um, I know a woman who wrote a best-selling novel sitting in her car with her with her laptop while she waited for her kids to get done with soccer practice. So you can you can find lots of different places. What you want is some place that's comfortable and where you're not distracted by a lot of things. Uh, you, then you want to find a time that works for you. And again, it's just what works for you. Uh, you need to think about uh, your own schedule and some people are in full-time jobs. I happen to be retired. Uh, if you're working full-time, it might be that you write on your lunch hour, you write on your coffee breaks, you write before you go to work in the morning if you're a, a lark, early alert, uh, or maybe you write late at night. Any time that works for you works for you. So it's a very individual thing and if you try one system and it doesn't work for you, you just change it. That's all. Just change it till you find what does work for you. Uh, you need to think about goals in your writing. And it's a lot, believe it or not, easier to write if you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to sit here and write until I get 200 words on the page. Or I'm going to sit here and write until I get a full page finished. Or I'm going to sit here and write between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. 
and I'm not going to get up out of this chair. If I can't think of a single word to write, I'm still going to sit here for that hour and look at the screen. You just set a goal for yourself. And again, if that goal doesn't work, you adjust it. Um, uh, this business of setting goals, I'll tell you a little story about uh, a man that was a friend of the family. And I met him after I married my husband. And he was very odd, <laughs> very odd indeed. And uh, after he went home, uh, later he got in touch with us and he apologized for his behavior while we were together. And he said, I want to tell you a little story. And he happened to own a lot of rentals. He used to rent uh, houses, small houses, to graduate students and college professors up in Ris Riverside. And he did all of his maintenance. He would not hire anybody to do maintenance for him partly because he was kind of cheap, but also he was good at it. Uh, and he was up on a ladder one day fixing something on a roof and he fell off the ladder. And the doctor said uh, that they did not know uh, whether he had a small stroke and fell off and, and uh, hit his head or uh, whether uh, he fell off, hit his head and then had a small stroke, but he had both things happen. Uh, and ended up in the hospital for quite a long time. And when he was in the hospital, it turned out that he had amnesia. And he saw this very nice lady standing next to his bed and she looked just a little bit familiar. Well, she was his wife and they'd been married for 40 years, but he could not, beyond saying she looked a little familiar, he had no memory of her whatsoever. Uh, when he was physically able, they took him home and he had to relearn a lot of things. But he was amiable and cooperative and worked on learning stuff. And as he was going through his daily routine one day, he had a little flash. And he said, that's strange. And a few days later, the same thing happened again. It was just a little flash of memory. He had a little scene that he saw, a door and a bookcase and a whatever. Uh, and he said, why, wow, that's really strange. So he got a little pad of paper and kept a pad of paper and pencil in his pocket. And when it happened the third time, he immediately sat down and wrote down everything he could remember from that little flash of memory. And his memory was beginning to come back. Every time he got one of those little flashes and they became more and more uh, part of his regular day that these flashes would happen. Every time he wrote down one of those little pieces of paper, he would sit down in the evening and sort of free associate and write. And he wrote about a page a night. And at the end of a year, he had about 350 pages, and he had, which is essentially a book. And he had rebuilt his memory by writing these pages and then putting them into an order after he figured out how they, how they fit together and wrote a, absolutely delightful, charming memoir of his early life. Uh, and so my point of this whole story is that if you write a page a night, at the end of the year, you have 365 pages and that's a book in anybody's uh, standard. So uh, set yourself goals, set yourself time, find yourself a location and just sit down and do it. Uh, now, one of the things you'll hear about writing is that it's a lonely uh, profession. No, gosh, no. <laughs> writing is very social. Uh, it's not lonely at all. And I would recommend that you look for people to socialize with and share your writing with and people who can mentor, your, mentor you. And one of the places you can look at is your local independent bookstore because it's quite likely that you have a bookstore fairly near you where they do book launches and book signings. And you can go and meet uh, re real for sure published authors. And these will all be people who are publishing uh, commercially because these things are pretty much all arranged by the publishing companies. You can go in and talk to them. Usually they'll be, if they're very popular, there might be 50 or 60 people, but if they're, just a uh, medium popular. There might be 10 people there and you could spend a lot of time talking to them, asking about their process. Uh, some of them actually talk, some of them are a little shy, 
and they will just open their book, read from it, close it, and leave as quick as they can, sign a few books and go. But a lot of them are very social, very willing to share their process with you, and enjoy talking to you as much as you enjoy talking to them. So take advantage of that resource. Uh, you also have a resource at your local public library because they will also have author talks and you can go in uh, and meet authors there and find out about the process of writing. The other thing that I would recommend that you look for, uh, certainly if you can find a mentor, that's great. I had that with Richard Letterer. He just, one day he said, how would you like to write a book with me? And I said, oh yeah, <laughs> you bet. And that's how I got started with that kind of thing. Uh, and you may be lucky enough to have that, or you may find somebody that you would ask them, would you mind reading some of my things? And they would say yes or no. And if they say no, what you haven't lost anything, so why not ask? Uh, but the other good thing to do is look for a read and critique group. And a read and critique group, the ones that I've been in have all met once a week. And you read maybe five, maybe seven pages. Uh, usually you get about 10 minutes, depending on how many people are in the group and how long it runs. Uh, and then they get a few minutes to suggest ways that you can improve the writing. And those, those experiences are very social, very valuable, and worth uh, looking for. And there's, uh, you can go on Meetup, I think Meetup still exists, and you can find one or you, through the bookstore or through the library, they will have resources that will uh, uh, tell you uh, how to get in touch with those people and those groups. And I want to, while we're talking about independent bookstores, I want to uh, encourage you to go to those bookstores, whether or not you choose to write, and uh, get acquainted with the booksellers, because they're usually really great people. Tell them what you like, and they will guide you to good books. They're very uh, delighted to help people find good books that they will enjoy. and. I, can, I just can't say enough for them. And I think it's very important for us as Mensons, and just as people in general, but specifically as Mensons, to not let Amazon and the other big corporations be gatekeepers on what we read. And the independent bookstores are the ones that are fighting that process. Uh, possibly a losing battle, who knows, but still, they're a place where you can go and find things that uh, Amazon may or may not have. And they're the ones who can guide you into reading things that Amazon would never recommend to you. Uh, so keep that in mind and go get acquainted with those people. Uh, now, sp speaking of uh, learning curve, as we were a little while ago, as I said, there is definitely gonna be a learning curve. You won't be especially satisfied with what you write at the beginning, or you may. What you need to do though, is for your own, what would I say, not satisfaction, but just your own process. You need to be able to look at your uh, work uh, and say, wow, this is good. Now, later on you might say, I can make this better, but you have to have faith in your own work and you don't want to ever uh, say to somebody or to yourself, well, this isn't very good. You know, can I read what you're writing? No, it's not very good. No, you don't want to do that. You want to say, boy, it's probably going to be the best thing that you ever read in your life, but it's not quite ready yet. So as soon as I have it available, I will uh, make it available to you. You have to have faith in your own work. Now, your learning curve, you're going to improve. But there's also something else going on, and that is, it may be that you do not have a skill for punctuation, or you are not very good at grammar. Who knows? You can hire people to do that for you. You can hire a high school student, a good, you know, somebody who's getting an A plus in their English class can do that stuff for you at not very expensive. You can hire a secretary to do final drafts for you, type things up. You cannot hire people to come up with the ideas that you're going to put in your writing. So keep that in mind. The, the, it's nice if you're perfect at editing. It's great if you get perfect at typing. But those are skills that you can hire. You can't hire the ideas. Uh, 
to talk a little bit about editing. I want to leave enough time for questions, so I'll talk another five minutes or so, and then we'll do some questions, and then if there's still time, we'll talk a little more. Um, editing is a process you, you're going to need to learn, and that's, uh, that's the rewriting process. And I have a process that works for me, and everybody that I know who has ever tried it says it works for them. A lot of people don't bother to try it, but the ones that do all like it. And that is, I do about 10 pages a week of editing. I read it one night out loud. Always, when you're editing, always read off paper. Don't read off the screen because you don't see things on the screen that you will see when you print. Okay, I read the first night and I'll probably say to myself, gee, that's really good stuff. And I won't make any changes. The second night, I'll read it out loud. No changes, it's perfect. Third night, I'll read it out loud. Well, there's one little tweak I could make. Okay, so I make that little tweak. If I make several little tweaks, I'll reprint because I don't want to be looking at red marks on what I'm reading. Fourth night, I read it out loud and I say, wow, this paragraph is in the wrong place. Fifth night, I read it out loud and I see a whole bunch of stuff. Because my mind has been sort of working on these things bit by bit by bit as I am doing other things during the day. And so if you just let your mind go free uh, to work on that, it will begin to see the things that you want to change. And the reason I recommend reading aloud is because lots of times when you're writing and not reading aloud, you'll end up with long, complicated, uh, clunky sentences, I guess is what I want to say. If you read it out loud, if you run out of breath before you get to the end of the sentence, it's too long. You need to cut it down or d divide it in half. Uh, if you have trouble and your, my, your mouth wants to put in a word or take out a word if you always skip over a word as you're reading that's your brain telling you hey that one doesn't belong there so you trust your mouth when you're reading aloud and if your mouth makes changes to what you're reading mark that down and think about it and think about whether you want to make that change per permanent um, so I, I really think the reading aloud process is just absolutely essential and you'll find your own rhythm with that kind of thing uh it's it's and part of what they talk about when they talk about writers is finding your voice and that reading aloud business is actually part of finding your voice because as you read aloud you will shift the writing into the way you talk and that's part of your voice that's not all of your voice your voice is also the ideas but the rhythm of your speech and the rhythm of your thinking will come out in the writing if you read it aloud. Now, one of the, one of the things I wanna emphasize on editing is that editing is a separate process from writing, very separate. Uh, if you think of you, your brain as having two halves, which it does, but metaphorically, and in one half you are creative and in the other half you are critical, you don't want that little critiquer who's in the other half of your brain interrupting your creative side saying ah you don't want to write that down that's not very good you want that part of your brain to shut up while you're creating so your first draft or even your second draft needs to be kind of free flowing and and uh, when your create critiquing part of your brain comes in the critical part of your brain comes in and says uh uh, uh you just say Go away and take a nap. I'm busy writing. Later on, you can invite that critical part back when you're ready to start uh, editing. But don't let that part of your brain interfere with the creative part of your, of your work. Uh, now I'm looking, I see three things on the chat, so I'm gonna have to click on those, I guess, and see if we've got some questions. Let's see what we see. Uh, yeah, I can read the questions here from the oh, chat. Oh, okay. So, not all of them perhaps went to me. Okay. Um, Joyce asks, are you a judge for the Mensa Bolton Fiction Contest? Any tips for writing a winning entry for that contest? 
Well, I'm not a judge, but I can give you some tips. And that is with short, short fiction is really hard. All fiction is hard from one point of view. And that is you really want every single word in your, what you're writing to move your story forward. And it's very difficult when you've written something that's wonderful to cut it. And there's a, that phrase, you have to kill your darlings. You have to do that in writing. And if you can't stand the idea of actually deleting something entirely, you can always move it to another file and bring it back later if you think it, you, it was a mistake to take it out. But uh, you, you need to probably, I would just say, cut, cut, cut as much as you can, all extraneous words. Uh, and here, here's where the reading aloud will uh, help you do that because your voice will will stumble on words that don't need to be there and it's a it's a real technique the other thing is you really have to there a lot of people if you if you grew up reading british novels for instance they old british novels take the first two chapters just setting scene okay if you're writing a novel nowadays, you cannot do that. You have to get your readers roped in. They call it the hook on the first page. And even more so if you're writing a short story, uh, you have to hook your readers in that first paragraph. Because if you don't get them in the first paragraph, they're probably not going to go to the second paragraph. So those are the two things that I think are most important. Get a good hook, a good beginning paragraph, starting with the first sentence, and uh, uh, read aloud and edit and cut all, <laughs> cut all the useless words, I guess is the way of saying it. Uh, and a way to train yourself is get some high quality short story writers, buy some, buy some books or take some books out of the library, and just read the first page of their short stories and say to yourself, I want to read the rest of this. Okay, why do I want to read the rest of this? Or I don't want to read this. This is kind of boring. Why is it boring? And that's one way. You know, those are the best teachers in the world if you look at the actual work they've done. So those are my tips. <laughs> Real good. Um, I've heard the uh, advice that you gave about writing and not editing. And I always end up uh, pretty much doing the two at the same time. I keep going back and fixing up a previous paragraph. I'll write something and I realize that it doesn't go where I'm writing. I need to put it somewhere else. And I've really tried that edit the write only and edit later and find it really frustrating. Mm. Um, this is an, another case of doing what works for you and you've tried it both ways and this works better for you. So it's fine. You know, there, there really are no rules. It's only what works and helps you be productive. But if you find that you're never getting to the last page of what you're writing by doing that, if you're constantly revamping the first 10 pages and never getting to page 11, uh, then you've got a problem. And that happens to a lot of people. They get so stuck in polishing that they never complete the task as a whole. Yeah, and I will generally do it at least uh, one pass over everything, maybe two, maybe three passes before I'm uh, done with the editing. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I almost always, when I'm writing, read, uh, depends on how many pages I have written. For instance, I'm writing the book review, it's due in tomorrow for, for June. And I always start, and I think of it as getting up to speed, and I read through the whole thing that I've written so far, because I don't write it all in one day. It takes me maybe a week, I do a book a day or whatever. Uh, and I, I read through it, and then I start typing. And I don't really make many changes when I read through. Sometimes I do, but generally it's just to sort of get me going in the rhythm of what I was writing. And the same thing with my novels. If I'm gonna be working on a novel, I always read the five or six pages that I, where I quit uh, the previous section and read five or six pages before I start typing, just to sort of get me up to speed with what's happening, get me into the rhythm of what I was doing and remind me of what characters were saying and doing at the time. So 
But again, it's what works for you. Uh, Sue has a couple questions. Um, why do you think everybody should write a memoir and uh, follow on is that what's the right format for a memoir, uh, the length, the topics, write it first person or, or some other? Um, uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the difference between uh, biography and memoir. And biography is something that starts with, I was born on such and such a date, and now I'm 97 years old, and you do the whole life story. Memoir is a short, shorter piece, no, well, not necessarily shorter, because people write whole books that are memoirs, but is a shorter piece of your life. So it can be, uh, I've just read a wonderful book about a guy's, and it'll be in the June issue, a guy's one year of playing in the French baseball major leagues, what, what goes for major league baseball in France. And so he's only writing about that one year, but you get his, basically his whole life in that one year, because you find out who he is. And uh, it's a book I would highly recommend. It's called uh, Have Bat Will Travel. Uh, and if you're writing memoir, it, it would be a good one to look up. But read current memoirs of, of sort of of the type. Always read what's called read the competition. Read current memoirs of the type that you th are thinking about writing. If you want to write about uh, your experiences in travel, then you want to read travel memoirs. If you want to write about your, your experiences in your marriage or with an illness, read what other people are writing in those fields. But uh, depending on, on what you're aiming for, you can start with short stories if you want. Just one page, two page, you know, flash fiction or like the, my friend did one page a night and each one of them was essentially a full chapter. Uh, so uh, you, you really can start with anything you want. If you have a story that you want to tell about something that happened in your life, that's what you do. Uh, why write memoir? I think, I think the more of us who can write contemporary history, you look at the number of people who devote their lives, for instance, to archaeology. And what are they doing? They're going back to try to find out what the daily lives were like of the people who lived in uh, Troy or uh, Hong Kong or wherever 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. People are spending much time and money on doing that. And we can give that gift to our posterity, whether it's our blood posterity or just general, uh, the general world. We can give them information on how we lived and what was important to us. And I think that's important to do for the history of the world. And we can, we can give that gift to all the people who come after us. That's why I think memoir is important. Good. Elizabeth asked a question. Uh, my memoir involves life with famous people. Any tips about writing for publication under those circumstances? Um, I'd, I'd want to know more about it. Maybe, maybe Elizabeth would want to send me the first five pages or something like that. I'd be, I'd be glad to look at it. Um, publishing, it, depending on whether you want to self-publish or commercially publish, uh, again, uh, you want to be reading what other people are writing. Uh, and my first question, I guess my first question would be, what aspect of life with famous people are you writing about, Elizabeth? And well, uh, she can't, I know she can't answer me, but... She can, uh, it's unmuted. I, I actually can. Carolyn, oh. thank you so much for this presentation. It's been extremely helpful. Appreciate your candor and your very practical advice. Um, I am an experienced writer, um, and I've had an interesting life. And some of the people that um, I, I would like to write about in my memoir are, are well-known people. And so my concern is, I've been interviewed frequently about my life with these people. And one of the things that I discovered working with the journalists over the years was that they would often have a particular um, agenda in terms of what they wanted to communicate. And so after a while, I started asking them, um, can, can I see my quotes in context and that kind of thing. And the reason I did it was because I didn't want to hurt the people involved. 
and yes. make sure that that their it, their story was told respectfully and that it was not misrepresented. So that's my biggest concern. Is um, you know my my life has been my life, and I'm going to say things in ways that I don't want to be hurtful to the heirs or the um, you know the family of the people I've been involved with. Yeah, I would. I think it sounds like you're writing something that's very interesting. I would be. Uh, I assume you're going to try to commercially publish. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you will have uh, an agent who will advise you. There are going to always be some questions of whether you write something that somebody might sue you for. So when you're writing about other people like that, but uh, if you've got a commercial publisher, he's going to he or she is going to uh, vet what you write for that. No, I think I think I think you need to start at the beginning and tell people beyond oh just I had an interesting life. Tell them why you feel it's important to write what you're writing, and why you pick these particular people. Because I'm my guess is you're not writing about all the important people you ever met, just the ones that impressed you the most in some way. So you need a hook at the beginning of that book that will draw people in. And the hook might be your conversation with some famous person that then leads you into writing about why you're there and uh, why you think this person is worth writing about and worth spending time with. Because basically what you're doing when you write a memoir is you're asking people to spend time with you. And you have to tell them, it's not any different than meeting somebody at a party, you have to be interesting to them in some way for them to read page two and page three and page four and right along. So you have to let them know up front that they're going to have a good experience with you and they should stick with it. Very helpful. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, you're welcome. Are there other questions? One question that always keeps coming up uh, is about grammar, people who do copy editing and uh, no good grammar and wondering what happened to them. Um, <laughs> oh, it's so can true. <laughs> continually uh, hear things on TV about Bob gave Tom and I the book. Oh, I know. And the newscasters just drive me nuts because you'd think they at least would know something about it. But I'm seeing more and more commercially published books that have just very basic grammar errors, which just astonishes me. And I think as with all else in life, you just have to set your own standards. I happen to have a copy of the Chicago Manual of Style right here next to my computer. And I'm looking in that all the time. I'm constantly looking up, I use Merriman Webster online dictionary and looking up to make sure I'm using a word correctly. And I really know I am, but I still want to double check. And you just, you set your own standards and you will learn as you do stuff. There, the th problem with, uh, with editing your own stuff can get to be so picky where you go back and forth. I often, this is my luxury item. I often call Richard Letterer and I say, let me read this sentence to you. Does it need a comma here? <laughs> and he will say, well, let me think about it. And then we'll go back and forth. And, or my editor, Chip, at the at Mensa Bulletin, I will write to him and say, here's my sentence. What do you think? So there's no way you can know all of that stuff. You just need to do the best you can, use the resources you have, and ask other people who you respect. Uh, but yeah, it, they, they, I don't know what they're teaching in English classes, but it isn't writing anymore, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> gripe, gripe, gripe. <laughs> no, I would say, uh reading a book about cosmology, I think it was. And I would, uh, on the second page of the preface, a uh, college professor uh, was the author, a uh, reputable publishing house, and he substituted than, T-H-A-N, for then. Mm. And I nearly put the book down. It yeah. Was, um, it just... I don't know who's reading this. Yeah, no, they're... they're... I'll tell you the way the things used to be. Used to be, you read all these wonderful stories about these writers in the 40s and the 50s and uh, that you wrote something and it was a very, you know, they had all these gatekeepers, but uh, you got to the, 
agent and the agent basically edited your book for you. And then they sent it on to the publisher and the publisher edited for you. It really did a heavy job of editing. I mean, you, you went through all kinds of stuff. Well, the day came when the agents got so busy that they said to their writers, I'm sorry, we just don't have time to edit for you anymore. So you will have to get it in, in camera ready uh, condition before I can send it to a publisher. And then the publishers started saying, well, you think it's camera ready, but it's not good enough. You're going to have to send it out to a professional editor. You, on your dime, are going to have to send it out to a professional editor someplace and get it camera ready. And basically now they don't want to see it till they can just flop it in and, and do it. And the problem is that uh, the other th and the other thing is uh, with the writers who sell, they work under the assumption that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that is if you're selling books and they're making money, they're not going to tell you how to edit your book. They're just going to, you hand it to them, they publish it. And uh, so a lot of stuff goes through because the authors, even though they're writing stuff that people want to read, don't know grammar that well, don't know punctuation that well. Uh, so it's, it's just the way of the world now. Everybody's in a hurry to make money. And they're not as qu quite as concerned with quality as they used to be. Yeah, Joyce asks uh, about a technological uh, solution to this problem. She asks, "Is Microsoft Word's grammar editor good enough?" No, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> and uh, you will learn that fairly rapidly when you write, because it will try to force you to change things which you know are absolutely right, uh, and. Ultimately, I mean, you could change everything they tell you to change, but and the same thing's true of their spelling editor. You cannot trust their spelling editor. Uh, you can use it and use the things that, that look right to you, but you can't trust it 100%. And uh, you don't really want to end up with your writing sounding like a computer wrote it. So no, you have to learn these things yourself. But as I said before, if you if it's just not your cup of tea, if you just really don't care about grammar, you just hire somebody. Hire somebody. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. We're at the end of our hour. Uh, Carolyn's website is carolynmccullaughauthor.com. Uh, thank you very much for this, Carolyn. Ah, you're welcome. And I'm glad to hear from anybody who's here today. <laughs>